Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is a loud mic. I'm Michael Dillon Welch, and together with Tanya McDonald, I'm pleased to welcome you to Soul Food Poetry Night. We have two featured readers tonight, and then there is an open mic with a sign up sheet down here. And we have a uh, question on each sign up sheet for you to list your favorite word. That's the question this month. And I will tell you that my favorite word is silver because I love L's, R's, and B's. So silver, you can't get more condensed with those letters than silver. Do you have another favorite word? Even a four-letter word? You're welcome to write it down. And that, of course, uh, is uh, presuming you uh, sign up for the open mic. If you just feel like sharing your favorite word, that would work too. To get us going, I'd like to read you a poem by a favorite poet of mine a British Columbia poet named Naomi Beth Wacken, and this is from her book, And After 80, which was the sequel to her book, Sex After 70. This is an organized life. I spend my life organizing my life, slotting it into cubby holes labeled food intake, leg movements, skin contacts, brain stimuli. I also have a list of ideas for my poems on the fridge, where I stick the week's menus, the day's schedule, what I should be doing in the next hour, and I stay alert for the haiku of the moment. Outside, I feel that children are probably tumbling down hillsides, shrieking with laughter, laughter enough to push the clouds higher in the sky. That is Naomi Beth Wacken. Uh, a note about our procedure tonight. We have our two featured readers, then we'll take a break, where you're required to eat all the food that's in the display case and, uh, and drink all the drinks. Um, Yes, <laughs> and uh, th then we'll have our open mic after that. And um, uh, do you guys have books for sale? You do? Okay, good. So there's some books to, to look at as well um, uh, at the break. So that, that's coming. All right, let me introduce our two featured readers. Um, first, uh, we, have, uh, we have two, Bethany Reed and Jennifer Bullis. And Bethany will be reading first. So I'll introduce her first. Her poetry has appeared in Superstition Review, A Room of One's Own, Prairie Schooner, Pontoon, and many other journals. In 2011, her poem, The Apple Orchard, won the Lewis Cranston Prize, and her latest book, Sparrow, can you wave it? Okay. Won the Gell Poetry Prize. She lives in Edmonds with her husband and three daughters, one of whom is here tonight. <laughs> she blogs at a writer's alchemy at wordpress.com. So please welcome Bethany Reed. <laughs> I brought my own peanut gallery. <coughs> so it's a real honor to be here. Michael, Tanya, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jennifer, for suggesting this. Um, I think I'll start with a new poem, Th and this is, am I doing okay on the mic? Okay. I'm really preoccupied this year with care of my mother, who moved from the farmhouse where she was born two years ago, um, after my dad's death, and to a retirement center, and is probably in the process of getting moved to assisted living. And that's, I spent the entire day on the phone interviewing people. Uh, but this is a story she's always told. I've told this story to people, and I decided to take seriously my old mentor, Nelson Bentley, who said that recurring memories are poems asking to be written. So I drafted this, and I, I don't think it's done, but I think it's close. True story about my mother, my mother's rapture. 
Since his heart attack, she's been watchful. Tonight, she wakes in the dark, and fear spreads over her, thick and stifling as an army blanket. He's not in the bed. She slips her legs from the bed, finds the floor carefully, as though it might not be there, might not hold her bare feet. She's untethered without him. He's not in the bathroom, not in the living room, not in his recliner where she found him that terrible night of the heart attack. He's not on the back porch where he sometimes watches television with the sound off. She walks back into the house, into the passage beside the kitchen, and she stands, frozen, as people say, though it's a warm night, even without a robe. Her nightgown sticks to her skin where sweat breaks out, trickling between her breasts. She's not frozen. She thinks of the Bible verse, of fear melting her heart like wax into her bowels. It's the rapture, and they took him and not me. It's not grief and no longer fear, it's anger. It's the rapture, and they took him and not me. Then, in the light from the kitchen window, she sees a figure at the sink, an angel, her husband, naked, blue in the window light. He turns on the tap and fills a glass with water, holds it toward her. She steps to him. She takes the water glass in her trembling hand, still here, the firmament still cradling her in its bosom. Um, I was raised in a Pentecostal church. <coughs> I love being a Presbyterian. They're like Buddhists. They're so laid back. Um, <laughs> I always say that. Uh, but it really is quite a shock to go from being the Pentecostal kid. So here's a, one poem about our church when I was a kid. What broke loose? I think, I think my daughter Pearl will kind of identify with this. Our church didn't allow the expanse of all hell breaking loose, though we might say heck and get away with it. We might say H-E double toothpick. What broke loose when all hell went? I didn't have that kind of childhood. We kept buttoned up. We minded. Somehow I learned to experiment with impossibility, the earth cracking like a too hot stove, bones budding like exotic flowers. The trick is to spend a little time each day imagining the unimaginable. Go early in the morning. Instead of saying hello, say oh hell. When the preacher says, do you take this man? Promise until hell freezes over. Wear layers. Be ready for every weather. <coughs> and here... Um, I bought a little horse at the counter, a spirit animal, but my actual spirit animal is a coyote, <laughs> the trickster. Um, and my first book of poems, which I could not lay my hands on to save my life today, uh, I was going to bring it and read a poem, is called The Coyotes and My Mom. So this book had to have one coyote poem, and one of the things I really like about this poem is that my step-niece, Shelby, turns up in this poem sort of willy-nilly. And a couple years ago, or uh, a year ago, my niece died um, in a diabetic attack. So I feel that this became a tribute poem for Shelby. Hunger. February's false spring brings to the farm a spate of new calves and a lone coyote tired of hunger. My mother calls the coyote he, as in you'd think he'd be satisfied with one, but he takes all plus one cow in labor. It's our version of tragedy, the small herd, the lost calves dramatic as Shakespeare, though I don't know who's the hero of this piece, maybe my brother's stepdaughter, 13, carrying her 22 rifle and stalking our coyote over the brown winter fields marshes seeping to her boot tops and the scree of a red-tailed hawk falling over the deep woods. Our coyote is nowhere to be found. 
in her den, I suspect, with wet pups, her dug so swollen she can't hunt. Then one new calf turns up at feeding time with its mother, and in the orchard, blossoms curl against black boughs like hands waiting to unfold. The Apple Orchard. Spring mornings, it was a regular whorehouse of an orchard. <coughs> the trees frowsy and bedraggled in their nightgowns and slippers, hair tangled, lipstick askew, straps slipping from shoulders. It was spring and then it was high summer, green apples so sour and hard I had to recoil without a bite. The names were Gravenstein, Transparent, King, and Chehalis, some of them pie apples, some that could last all winter in a box in the pantry, some good only for eating fresh from the tree. The cows came into the orchard in October and ate the windfalls, ate until they were drunk on apples. Deer came, raccoon and opossums. The trees didn't care who used them. They were perfectly promiscuous. November, with its sharp teeth, stripped them bare. And I have to read one poem about being a horse, since Jennifer is my friend, the horse person. <coughs> that long spring. That long spring of her 15th year, she told herself, I am too old to be a horse. So she stopped tossing her head the way her mother hated, <coughs> as if her mane caught the sunlight. After chores, she walked from the barn to the house without once breaking into a gallop. That was the year she nursed a crush on a boy in the class ahead of her. But another girl asked him to the Sadie Hawkins Day dance, and after that, they were going steady. In May, when prom rolled around, she helped decorate the lunchroom, fanning pink tissues and stuffing them in chicken wire to look like roses or gardenias, some climbing flower, though they looked really like nothing but wadded Kleenex. Her arms ached from the effort of holding herself quiet. She stood in the parking lot beneath a night sky that would gladly have taken her to its breast, a sky thick with stars as an Appaloosa's back with spots. A half moon skimmed the dark, clouds trailing like broken reins. <coughs> and since I brought my three 20-year-olds, I'll read a poem about when I was 20. Do you want a sex poem or a... <laughs> dear. Her revenge. When you dropped by to say you were working late, then sat you... <laughs> I have to start over. <laughs> when you dropped by to say you were working late, then sat flirting with Debbie at the counter, I spat in your coffee cup before I refilled it. When you said she was only your roommate and besides a hell of a little housekeeper, I took a crowbar to your back door. I let in the dog with her muddy paws, her coat smelling of skunk. When you called to break things off, I held the phone upside down by its cord like a rat by its tail. When you asked me to bring back your Audi, I pushed it off a cliff on Chuckanut Drive right into the bald red sun sinking its face into ocean's blue legs. When you smiled like the jackal you are and said you were glad we were friends, I slipped into the kitchen. I leaned my hands against the wall and took a long, long breath. I listened to the knives, their bluesy, low-throated songs. <laughs> Watch out for me. <laughs> okay. <coughs> this is me as kind of farm girl watching, I don't know, Sarah Plain and Tall or something. What tongue but my own. At 20, I was in love with the idea of marriage, its matched linens and flatware, the shine of polished linoleum. If local boys failed me, I would place an ad in some Midwest weekly, the Farmer's News Tribune, the Nebraska Digest. 
I dreamed of steering a tractor between fields of ripe corn, my blonde stepchildren running behind me. I knew it was a story from the pages of a romance novel, only a dream. But in that dream, I held up my side of a white sheet and matched daughters corner to corner. Here was meaning, my childhood done over, this time without the burden of feeling. Hens offering blue eggs, cows waiting in their stanchions to be milked, horses galloping along fences, spring water unbridled by swamps. Nights from my husband's arms, I watched the horizon sway like a boat full of stars. Who would grow up to leave paradise? What tongue but my own could unbraid me from that Eden? Anybody keeping time? Did we forget? Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> Michael, how am I? A few more minutes. Okay. So I have to read a couple of poems about my kids. Um, I held a friend's baby and uh, went home and wrote this poem. This was back in my one bad poem phase, which I wrote one poem a day for about five years and sometimes they weren't bad <laughs> but my friend Janet has a brand new grandbaby so a habit of grief some griefs come to us newborn tiny and toothless their eyes twitching legs folded against their bodies as though they will never go farther than we carry them and who wouldn't fall their worried wrinkled foreheads their cries in the dark bringing us stumbling, milk spilling against our nightshirts. Years pass before they're big enough to burden, legs wrapped awkwardly around a waist. Grief, people say, fades with time. Yet some griefs insist on themselves gradually, escorting us only at long last to their brink, to the abyss of them, the one place we can learn reeling by what small hands we are held. Um, is it time for the last poem or one or two? Okay. Um, I have two 20 year olds, twins, <coughs> and um, a 14 year old. And my 14 year old had a boyfriend named Sebastian last spring. Now there's somebody new. <laughs> but um, I was just thinking that their n the boys' names were uh, all kind of ponderous and long and meant something. So um, I was s kind of had a sleepless night last spring uh, over my then 13-year-old. And... This poem came out of an exercise that I did, Naming the Boyfriends. I won't try to explain it because I'm not sure I get it. <laughs> but it has this weave of seeing red and obsessing over it. Naming the Boyfriends. Another red light. Behind me, a red car revving its engine. My daughter's boyfriends bear the names of saints, Irish poets, Old Testament prophets. I gave each of my daughters a name with a metaphor's heft, as if they could be their own talismans. Instead, these young men, tall, dark-clad, bearded, my girls like lucky stones in their pockets. Traffic is heavy today. I didn't sleep half the night and feel the pang of a martyr's guilt for having slept at all. At the next intersection, two red cars, a red pickup, Having daughters, who needs any other obsession? All the way home, red, red, red. <coughs> and I wanted to end with this poem because it's, it's very new and I've been working on it and friends from this workshop I took in at Ponderay, Idaho, wanted copies of it. I'm not sure it's good enough. So I'm going to inflict it on you just to hear how it sounds. <coughs> I think I think it's worth it. It started out um, actually as a song, and I took it to my writing lab, and they made me read it because I was so like doing the pre-reading apology. <coughs> I said, "Just read it." <laughs> um, 
and the first thing that he said was, well, it's salvageable, but it's not a song. <laughs> Give that up. <laughs> so I think it's a poem. Geese in Flight. To reach Lake Pondere, you drive all day, arrive as the sun falls into the water, late November, geese peppering the pink surface. You wait for morning, cautious, before you zip your coat, pull on a pair of borrowed gloves, and walk out into the cold. You walk under leafless trees and down a hill, past a sign that says no trespassing, past an empty house. You mean to walk faster than anger and fear and sadness. That's why you came. But you find them waiting on the shore, tongues lolling, eyes eager at the sight of you a lake fringed with ice like an apron with lace. And now it seems you've brought not just the usual pack of dogs, but your mother too. You'll fall through. You'll soak your shoes. You'll catch your death of pneumonia. Geese lift from the lake's surface, Canada geese, 30 or 40 pairs of wings, a whir of motion and sound before they settle into a V and fly away, sailing just lower than the dark batting of clouds. You dare yourself onto the ice, and it is thin, but you prove light enough. You stoop to pick up a pane that has floated free, a looking glass you might see your face in, a reminder of who and what you are, the child you once were. Isn't that her watching an invitation in her smile? Shuffle your feet, take a two-step, Make a little slide. Let go of fear. Let your life hold you. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Next we have Jennifer Bullis, and her bio is this. She grew up in Reno, Nevada and earned a PhD in English from UC Davis, and I think we may know some professors in common, and taught at Whatcom Community College for 14 years. So easy to say 14 years, but think about that. It's a long time. Her poems appear in Iron Horse Literary Review, Natural Bridge, Conversations Across Borders, Cascadia Review, Comstock Review, and the Floating Bridge Review, and Pontoon. Uh, the poems in her collection, Impossible Lessons, do you have that to wave? Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Published by uh, Moonpath Press uh, last year. Engage leaf and stem and longing, explore seasons of loss, and trace the long kindnesses of family. She continues to live in Bellingham with her husband, son, and horses, and thank you for making the trip. Please welcome Jennifer Bullis. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. <coughs> and thank you, Tanya McDonald and Michael Dylan Welch, both of you, for uh, having Bethany and me here this evening. I would also like to thank, um, as I understand it, the other co-founder of this series back several years ago, Mana Hechtman Ayers, um, who uh, is the publisher at Moonpath Press, and whom I have to thank for having um, this chapbook in print. <coughs> she, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> I'm getting past a cold, is, uh, she publishes Pacific Northwest uh, Coastal Poets, and um, thank you, Tanya, um, and has been very generous um, as an ambassador for the art form of poetry and getting it into the world, so she very much has my gratitude for that as um, well as for working with you to begin this series of readings. Um, I will start tonight by reading some poems that are inspired by some ancient stories. Um, I've been reading mythology the last several years, having never really encountered it or studied it before that. Um, I just knew there were ancient stories out there that I was not familiar with, and so I aimed to remedy that. Um, 
and was has been reading around the Mediterranean region primarily, um, but also farther north and west into Europe, um, really enjoying the strangeness of those stories, particularly myths of origin, um, origins of peoples, uh, stories of how did we how did we get uh, stories that answer the questions like how did we come to be who we are in this place. Um, I will start with one titled, Ten Great Gifts for the Woman Who Has Nothing. For the journey out, figs, fig leaves for carrying the blame, a womb and a man worthy to name it, another rib and even more backbone, the pomegranate, secrets still intact, anklet of snakeskin, woven bracelet of grass, a circlet of worry for her newly conscious brow, for her hair still smelling of blossoms and smoke. This is titled Eve Reflects. From time to time my bite is awaking to the lift of thought, to the press of deciding. Occasionally my taste is a meteor bolting from the windowed castle of the moon into the slim shadow of my turning. At times that apricot is all I know of the globe, a blushing tear I met with the small hairs on my cheek. Now and then my swallowing is a long drop out of cloudy agreement into firm thought. From time to time my temptation is a dance step named curiosity, a low bounce with a glance into wondering. Now and again my teeth are a near miss, depending on the compass of the reader who is turning to the page where I am being named. Every so often, the weight of my soul is suspended in that lamplight. From time to time, all my words fit on a single petal, small and pitted, a bruised gift I cup with my hand. <coughs> Here are a couple of persona poems in which I speak in the voice of... Um, <coughs> sort of an amalgamation of several um, Mediterranean regional goddesses and uh, also a Northern European. <coughs> I was sort of reading, uh, reading a lot of different mythologies at once and started to see some common threads, and the stories were bizarre and compelling and wonderful. So this is titled Some Friend. Towards Helen I am peeved. She refuses to participate in my mythoparesis. She told me, honey, last time you took up that project, your wings went all waxy. True, but someone was roasting an ibex, and I couldn't be bothered. The fact is, she doesn't approve of the way my three breasts line up. She says I'd need nine heads and two more guitars, even to begin to pull off the cubist effect. Can a girl just get a little veneration? When we were kids, Helen flat refused to play Lumen Spindle with me even when I said she could be Weaver Woman of the Universe. She still gets mad when I embroider any yarn. She dislikes my searching for the fragments of Osiris and remembering his torn body. But the last straw seemed to be when I pleaded her to bridesmaid my next wedding to a new druid king. You see, as priestess queen, at the end of his short reign, I sacrifice him to ensure good harvest. <coughs> Helen snorted, girlfriend, there is no way in God's green erogenous zone I will tart up so you can knock off another monarch in his prime. I begged, but the old symbols, they're falling away. Please, won't you reenact with a sipped cup even one of the old time rituals? Helen replied with a stop hand and a shake head, saying, Love girl, I'm not that into you, but all I want is reverence where reverence is due. <laughs> Thank you for chuckling. <coughs> Here's that goddess again, sometime later. Cover letter from the goddess. Dear prospective employer, after some two millennia away to raise my sons, I seek to re-enter the workforce of the paid. To your team, I bring sheaves of wheat and solar panels, as well as new remedies for your seasonal allergies. I produce at the rate of one new king every fourth winter, 
and a new crop of candidates every fourth spring. If you are a locavore, I can grow an entire village for you to eat. I can stem your flood of customer complaints and bloom wherever you choose to plant the pieces of my brother. I have a strong record of making ends meet beginnings and holding it all together on a shoestring. For compensation, I expect an executive range. Three to 13 members in upper management annually should meet my needs. I invite you to a luncheon interview on Aventine Hill at your convenience. Please bring wine, oil, and a white bull calf, and my slim assistants will greet you from the trees. <laughs> Thank you, I funny, funny. I'm still trying to imagine further poems for that goddess. She's kind of fun to work with. She's sort of naive, but you know, really likes her own power. <coughs> um, <coughs> I've also worked um, some mythological uh, aspects into more personal poems. Um, here, here's one about horses, since Bethany has written about horses and, and mentioned mine. Um, they're sort of my totem animal. Um, in uh, there's this legend and, and myth of um, Procne and Philomela that has been made a lot of use of in poetry and literature and, and music as well. Um, and there are many different versions of how the ancient story goes, but um, one of them that's a, a commonly acknowledged one is that two sisters, Procne and Philomela, um, Philomela was assaulted by King Tereus, um, Procne's husband, who tore out her tongue to prevent her from telling the story. And the sisters took their revenge by weaving the story into a tapestry. Um, but then the gods transformed Philomela into a nightingale and Procne into a swallow. <coughs> and so these are origin stories for the songs of both of those birds, or the, the lack of singing. <coughs> Um, my poem is titled, Among Swallows and Horses, Working Out My Post-Critical Subjecthood. <laughs> the swallows swivel and bank, out and back in, while I muck the horse stalls. No longer emblems of Procne or Philomela, the swallows signal only that the bugs have hatched, that they've returned to catch them, 60 mosquitoes and flies per hour each, to feed to their hatchlings. All eyes and beaks, the cup-nested young perch in the barn rafters, and between their noisy feedings, watch me interrogate my good luck to be working among horses and the soft bodies of birds. Is it wrong to want to say that they mean something other than their otherness from me? In ancient times, the stories linked humans to every conceivable type of wing. A professor taught me that myth-making is the verbal construction of hegemony over the unknowable. This was one way in which going to graduate school was like taking your inner child to be circumcised. <laughs> First the liturgy, then sharpness, and shrieking. But, <coughs> but keeping covenant carries risk in exchange for new ways of getting your questions answered. And still, theories drift down to me like small feathers, while I rake and shovel below the nests, like blessings, soft, even to a girl bereft of her tongue. Another poem from the horse barn, titled Lesson Horse. I trailer you home from the stable where I have left you while I was away for the summer. You are gaunt, hollow-eyed, a dispirited rack of bones under faded orange hide. The barn manager had promised me you'd be exercised as a lesson horse, and indeed you have taught me never to entrust to another the work my own heart hands me. I settle you into your stall at home and arrange the pasture fences so as to manage your hunger. One full day's grazing on sweet grass would sicken you worse than three months underfeeding. I give you instead many small handfuls of alfalfa hay, the proteinous stalks crumbling richly in your teeth. 
hand feeding you is solace against the tear inside my chest, like fulfillment of a late assignment, or hope storing up in your thin tissues for the day when I can exercise you myself again, and you turn leaf and stem and longing into muscle. The one strength you haven't lost is your robust forgiving of everything past, your attention now on the food in front of you, my open hand. <coughs> Thank you. Here's a, another animal poem titled Strange Accounting. Grieving Tomcat flattened in the road Easter morning. I told over the litany of his many names and nicknames and wept harder at daffodil. His orange tabby patches and white roundnesses, the blameless pink of his nose and mouth and ears, had all suggested increase of blooming and brightness. Amid the lilies, I always forget. This is my season of loss, of wondering what to do with loss, of watching as the cosmic accounts are reconciled by means of a heroic and terrible dying. I struggle to understand the system of bookkeeping. Still, the ultimate audit intrigues me. And that night I reread the Franciscan, who says that when you are resurrected, all that your heart has loved is resurrected with you. And so I prayed for salvation not so much for my own body as for the eventual unburying of fur, of purr and pink and scamper, and the everness of springtime without passing. <coughs> I wish I spent as much, out, as much time outside as my poems make it seem like I spend outside. But one, one major source of inspiration uh, for my writing is walking. I like to just absorb details, um, observations as I walk, and there's something about the, the kinesthetic uh, movement combined with uh, meditative attention that seems to inspire poetry for me and, and many others, too. <coughs> this is titled Strange Bird. <coughs> what bird are you? Hawk-shaped, gray, tail-striped, and neck reined in white. You hover and swoop low a few feet above the hay stubble, spying for mice. Once you dart down, scramble in the grass, lost to my view as you sate your raptor's appetite on some ground-bound creature. But if hunting's your purpose, why do you round me in your orbits, flying me in your sights between flights to the field's far corners? What am I to you? I wonder further, amble the field. Then you return again, hover, and drop this poem into my mouth. <coughs> One thing I love about winter hiking is the sharpness of everything, especially um, on clear days when the light is sharp. It's pale, pale light, but it's present uh, and the air is icy. This is titled Day After Thanksgiving. This razor bright morning, I hike the South Fork of the Nooksack to see the salmon running. Up from oceans, following some scent of granite, they've sliced their way to these beds of gravel to spawn and die. More are dead now than swimming in the water sharded at its edges by ice, their brown and silver bodies piling where the steep stream pools. I hike higher up a logging road, its skin graveled with small stones like salmon scales and layered with copper leaves, fish-shaped, blade-like, their centers rotting, serrated edges glinting and steely with frost. I rest the edge of a clear cut, and watch the peaks of the twin sisters tear their slow bite into the sky, rock and snow piercing the blue, and ponder how all this dying puts a point on the tip of gratitude, hooking in the throat like barb-cold air, 
sharp like salt on the tongue. <coughs> For my last poem, um, I'd like to read a poem that I wrote in tribute to William Stafford. His birthday is tomorrow, and all this month, all around the Northwest, there are tribute readings uh, being held uh, in remembrance of William Stafford, a uh, tremendously loved, well-loved and influential poet. Um, <coughs> a couple of years ago, in the fall, visiting the Metal Valley um, on Highway 20, just over the, the crest on the east side of the Cascades, um, I encountered a placard that had a William Stafford poem on it. And apparently, about 20 years ago, um, tw er, um, seven of William Stafford's poems that he wrote on commission um, uh, with the U.S. Forest Service were posted in the Metal Valley all down Highway 20 on the east side. The, um, there's one at the... Um, Washington Pass Crest at the, the highway rest stop that's still standing, um, and another that's along a, a foot trail um, between the small towns of Mazama and Winthrop, Washington. There are others in place. Apparently, um, the remainder of the seven have been damaged by weather and by snow plows that accidentally clipped them in the deep snow. Uh, and there have been movements to try to restore them, but as I understand it, the money has not been gathered to get them re, um, <coughs> replaced and, and refurbished. But a few of them are still there, and I was very surprised to encounter one on foot, um, and, and it just completely made my autumn to find poetry along this beautiful trail. Um, it's a, a William Stafford poem titled Where We Are, um, and uh, my poem borrows some uh, images and phrases from William Stafford's. <coughs> Crossing the Metal at the Tox Foster Suspension Bridge, after William Stafford's poem, Where We Are. Daylight loves everything coming up this river, like the fog, like the slow reveal of a poet's seer as he stands on the swaying bridge, suspended over the swift channel of his imagining. Walking this footpath so many years behind him, I stand atop the bridge's curve and look downriver, the sun setting behind me, loving the wet sky violet. An oxbow moon floats on the horizon as gold cottonwoods shuffle their starlings from one branch to another and finally breathe them out over the river's mottled glow. Every bird's flight renews my eyes slow marveling, like the rain locating boulders under its feet friendly, stepping and tapping and greeting them one at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer and Bethany. Um, and of course, thank you as always to Soul Food Books. Let's take a short break. If you'd like to add your name to the sign-up sheet, it's right down here. And if you could, add your favorite word next to your name if you'd like to read. Uh, so we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 